The book of Proverbs gives us wisdom for life. This, this book uh, really gives us the secrets to a blessed life here on this earth. It talks about a variety of subjects. We've been talking out of the book of Proverbs since January. We are still in it. We're still working through it. And we have a couple of more to go after this one. But I knew this was coming up a long time ago and have been uh, both excited and dreading this conversation because it's what the book of Proverbs says about families, how to manage families. The Proverbs, it, it gives us to us in short points. They're profound. They are from God. They are truth. Uh, but they don't necessarily set well with where our culture is headed because our culture is headed as fast as it can away from truth instead of towards, toward truth. And so when we start talking about families, we start talking about some issues that are very, very relevant and very, very divided as far as our culture is concerned. So I'm going to address them. I'm going to try to address them uh, head on. I'm going to try to be as kind as I can be without compromising truth. Uh, I'm, I cannot guarantee that I'm going to do a great job with both of those. But let's just talk about family for a minute. Let's go back to uh, the Garden of Eden. God created man and woman. He put them together and formed the first family. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go forward and multiply and fill the earth. And so the first command we ever got from God was go build a family. That's what God's intention is. And, and a family, we call it the nuclear family in our culture, is, is this. This is the design of God. It's, it's a, a man who becomes a husband. It's a woman who becomes a wife. They come together. They have sex. They have babies. Those babies grow up to form the family. So the family is a husband and wife. The first command is go forward and multiply, have kids, and build cultures, build societies on that family unit. It's called a nuclear family unit. It is the backbone of all cultures. If you will go and study history from a sociological perspective, so goes the family, so goes the culture. Anytime a culture, historically, begins dividing that family, where there's divorce, where there's homosexuality, where there's the breakdown of the nuclear family. As the family breaks down, the culture breaks down, the society breaks down, and finally there will be a fall of that nation or nations. Uh, go back and look at Babylonian culture, Greek culture, Roman culture, uh, the British Empire, and now the American Empire. You can look at these cultures and they're only as strong as the nuclear family. And when the nuclear family comes under attack, um, the, the society breaks down and finally falls. Um, I, I, I could spend an hour talking to you about how that works in the culture and looking at different cultures, but I'm, I'm going to spare you that. But for today, you just have to understand that that's the case. Okay. So you ask yourself the question, okay, if, if that's the way God set up society to work, husband, wife, and kids, what would Satan do to upend that? If, if you were Satan and you were saying, okay, God's design for culture is to be built around the nuclear family, well then what would Satan do to upend the nuclear family? Because remember, Satan has come to what? Steal, kill, and destroy, John chapter 10. That's what Satan does. That's his role. That's his identity. He wants to upend what God has set in place. He wants to undermine it. He wants to destroy it. He wants to steal from it. He wants to kill it. He is the destroyer. So what, how would he destroy a nuclear family? Well, number one, he would, he would cause divorces. And when you just look at the no-fault divorce that began to take place, <coughs> excuse me, several uh, years ago, you will see what it's begun to do to culture. Okay, so divorce. Uh, you, would, you would do whatever it takes to uh, slow down the birth rate. And Satan has done many things in our culture to slow down the birth rate so that we, we, do not, um, we do not procreate the way that we used to. You add in homosexuality and, and changing the, the way that the, the nuclear family looks. Um, and of course, when you start thinking about slowing down birth rate, what a great way to slow down the birth rate other than homosexuality, right? Two men are not going to have a baby. Two women are not going to have a baby. Slowing down the birth rate, redefining family, taking away the nuclear family through divorce. 
it just goes on and on and on. Um, and I could, I could go into a whole lot of other issues about uh, ultimately what Satan would like to do is create one gender where uh, men become more feminine, women become more masculine, men desire men, women desire women, men aren't satisfied being a man and want to become a woman, women are no longer satisfied becoming a woman, they want to become a man. It just, it just completely undermines culture and destroys everything that God is about in a culture. And it will bring down and destroy a culture. It has historically and it will again, and that includes America. Uh, transgenderism, um, it is not according to God's plan, therefore it is sinful and wrong, as is homosexuality. I'm not ever going to back off that because God never backs off that. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible is truth. We have to stand for the Bible. We cannot go against truth and expect our culture to survive. And it's not going to survive that. And, and the whole uh, LGBTQ community, that issue is going to destroy our country. It's going to divide our country. It's already divided our country. God will come and judge these issues. When you start looking at transgender issues and what it does to people when they actually go through the surgery to change from man to woman to woman to man because they were not created that way, um, go do the research and see what it does to their bodies and see what it does to their lifestyle and see how it shortens their lifespan and, and, and see what has to happen in order for a man who has gone through the surgery to remain a woman or a, or a woman who has gone through the surgery to remain a man. It is inhumane what we're doing to these people. It's inhumane what we're doing to children and God will come and judge all this. Um, I, I want to say one more thing and then we're going to jump into the text. And, and I know what I'm saying is wildly unpopular and, and I get that, but, I, but my job is not to give you popularity my job is not to give you what culture thinks. My, God, my job is to tell you what God says. And God built a nuclear family, and He is against anything that undermines the nuclear family, including everything we've just talked about. But I will tell you this. Uh, my age group, 50 and older in America, 1% consider themselves on the LBGTQ community uh, in that encompassing that whole thing, about 1%. 25 to 50, 6 to 8 percent. 18 to 24, this is the brand new stat that just came out, 18 to 24, 39 percent of that age group considers themselves somewhere on that scale of the LGBTQ community. 39 percent. Over 60, 1 percent. I'm sorry, over 50, 1 percent. 25 to 50, 6 to 8 percent. 18 to 24, 39 percent. They are the ones that are buying the lines. They're the ones that are most confused. They're the ones that Satan has really got his hand in. They are the ones that are buying the media propaganda around this whole issue. Um, and, and we're going to pay the price for that in generations to come. We are going to be held accountable for the lies we've told these kids and, and what we've done to destroy their lives. Having said that, <clears throat> and I know I've said it without a lot of emotion. I know I've just kind of stated it as factual. Um, let me just say that what it does to families is terrible. And it upends families, and it destroys families, and it divides families, and it's going to divide culture. It's going to destroy culture. God's ways are still God's ways. And when we don't follow God's ways, we have to pay the price. And it's terrible what we're going to have to pay for this. Having said that, um, what's God's way? What does the Bible say about this? Well, um, what does a strong family look like? Uh, number one, strong families have solid marriages between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman. Proverbs chapter 31, 10. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She is more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her and she will greatly enrich his life. She brings him good, not harm all the days of his life. And then he goes into um, the details of what that looks like for her. But he comes and concludes in verse 28, her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive 
and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. If I was talking to a young man in this culture, if I was talking to my son, and I could give him one piece of advice about marriage, I would tell him to remember verse 30. Charm is deceptive and beauty will not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. When you're looking for a wife, don't look for a pretty face and big boobs, okay? Don't look for that. Look for a woman who loves the Lord with all her heart and build a family with that woman because that's the family that will last for generations. Because when you're building a family, you're building a legacy. What legacy do you want to leave for your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids? And what you want to leave is you want to leave a family that is strong and beautiful and godly. That's what you're looking for. And so the first principle that the Proverbs lays out for strong families is solid marriage. Now, I want to talk to you about secular research. Secular research says that the number one indicator of kids growing up to be healthy adults is being in a nuclear family where there is a good, solid marriage. I talk to people all the time that are in tough marriages and they're trying to contemplate whether they should stay for the kids or get a divorce. You know what they found is research tells us that kids grow up healthier in a bad marriage than in a divorce situation. Now that's counterintuitive. We, we want to say, no, man, if I'm in a bad marriage, what my kids need to see is me divorcing and getting away from him and going and finding someone else and building a strong marriage so they can see the way it's supposed to be. And that sounds logical, but it ends up being a satanic lie. It's not true at all. The truth is, man, I want to tell you something. Staying in there for the long haul with your spouse for the sake of the kids, it's worth it for how the kids turn out to be, sociologically speaking. That's what the, the stats tell us. Now, that's hard because many of you have had divorces, are divorced, are single. What do you do with that? Well, I'll tell you exactly what you do with that. God heals. God heals. God transforms. I'm talking about the ideal. The ideal is one husband, one wife, good marriage, for life, has kids, grows those kids up. That's where the healthiest kids come from. If you've gone through a divorce, if, if you are single again, and you're raising children or you never got married and you're raising children. I'm not saying your kids are destined to be failures. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying the statistics bear out. It's better to have a husband and a wife with two kids. That's what the stats bear out. However, God can work through any situation. God is the healer. God is the transformer. God saves lives. God saves kids. And so it doesn't mean that you're bound for failure. What it means is the odds are a little bit stacked against you and you have to work harder. You have to submit to the will of the Lord. You have to turn your kids over to God and you have, you have to build a, a family that, that is not ideal, but it can still be strong for the Lord. All I'm saying is when you look at stats, when you look at what's going on in life, here's what you need to know. Strongest families are a husband and a wife with kids. Let's go to the next one. Strong families practice irrational love. Irrational love. That's not how the Proverbs describes it because that's a word from our culture. Our culture calls it irrational love. But I love what Proverbs says here in 23, 24, and 25. The father of godly children has cause for joy. What a pleasure to have children who are wise. So give your mother and father joy. May she who gave birth be happy. You know, he's talking about strong families again. He's talking about the beauty of strong families. And Psalm 127.3 says, Your children are a gift from the Lord. So when you're married and you have kids, that's a gift. That's a gift from God. And strong families practice what we call irrational love. In biblical terms, it's called unconditional love. And what we find is, is that unconditional love <clears throat> creates strong kids that grow up to be strong adults. When you have a family with two parents that give irrational love, unconditional love, in other words, I'm going to love you and it's not based on your behavior. 
<clears throat> it's not based on your performance. If, if you have a love that's not based on your behavior or performance, that's called unconditional love. I'm gonna love you because of who you are, not because of what you do, not because of what you give to me. I'm just gonna love you because you're my child. When you have that kind of irrational, unconditional love, I love you for who you are, not based on performance. When you have two parents giving that kind of love to kids, the stats are very high that those kids are gonna grow up to be high functioning uh, adults. In the house where you have one parent giving irrational love, I love you because of who you are, not what you've done, you still have very high probability of, of great kids that grow up out of that and, and grow up to be strong adults. If you do take away both of those and you have families where your love is based on performance or the, ki or the parents are just gone and the parents are left to raise themselves, then the stats go way down that you're going to have kids that grow up to be normal, healthy adults. That's just the way God designed us to be. We need that unconditional love of parents um, to understand the unconditional love of God so that we can grow up to be healthy adults. Uh, it's interesting to me that, that you have to have that parent that is in there for you. you. You just have to have that parent that says, I love you no matter what. I love you unconditionally. I love you for who you are pouring into them, pouring in faith to them, pouring in, in identity to them, then they grow up with a strong identity and then become healthy adults. So strong families, strong families have one or other adults that's pouring into the child, giving them what the world calls irrational love, what the Bible calls unconditional love. That is a huge component toward building strong adults out of your kids that will pass on generational blessing, that will pass on strong families to the next generation. When you're building the legacy of your family, uh, unconditional love for your kids is a huge part of that. So you want to build a strong family that builds a legacy for generations. Number one, build a strong marriage with someone of the opposite sex. Number two, you pour unconditional love into your kids. You love them not for what they do, but for who they are. It's called a blessing. Um, every year to every other year now, but when the kids were younger, I did it more often. I write them emails or letters to express to them how much I love them for who they are. I don't talk about their accomplishments. I don't talk about what they've done. I talk about their character. I love you for who you are for how God has created you, your uniqueness, your bent, your just, just what God has done in you. I love that. And I would encourage you as a parent to really give that to your kids. That will make a huge difference in long term who they turn out to be as adults. Really, really important. Strong families provide unconditional love that ends up growing up strong kids that become strong adults. Okay, number three, strong families live within boundaries. They live within boundaries. They, they know how to give unconditional love, but they also are willing to give discipline. This is where the Proverbs gets very, very, very controversial with our culture. I'm going to read a lot of scripture here, so just excuse me here while I turn in my Bible to these different scriptures. Proverbs 13, 24, those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children, those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. Listen to that word of wisdom from Proverbs. I'm going to talk about that here uh, in just a moment. 1918. Discipline your children while there is hope. Otherwise, you will ruin their lives. You don't discipline your kids, you're setting them up to ruin their lives. Proverbs 20, 20 and 21. If you insult your father or mother, your light will be snuffed out in total darkness. An inheritance obtained too early in life is not a blessing in the end. What's the advice from the Proverbs? Don't give your kids too much too early. Don't give them too much. The more you give your kids, the more likely you are to ruin their lives. Don't give them too much. Teach them how to work for what they get. Teach them how to earn what they get. Don't give them too much too early. Proverbs twenty-two fifteen: A youngster's heart is filled with foolishness, 
but physical discipline will drive it far away. Proverbs 23, Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Don't fail to discipline your children. They won't die if you spank them. Physical discipline may well save them from death. And then Proverbs 29, this is the last one. I know I'm reading a lot of these. Proverbs 29, 15 through 17. To discipline a child produces wisdom. A mother is disgraced by an undisciplined child. Discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. If you'll go down to, uh, I live in Arizona, if you'll go down to uh, CPS in Arizona, there's uh, one of these proverbs that talks about disciplining your children, physical discipline, spanking your children. And it, it has the sign on the wall, it has the proverbs, and then, and then basically says, um, the Bible is wrong, you cannot spank your children. If you spank your children, you know, you, you, you're involved in the CPS ch system, we will take those children from you. Um, so, what are we to believe? The Bible or culture? See, that's what you have to address in your own heart when you start talking about the nuclear family, what makes up a nuclear family, the whole L LBGTQ community and what they're pushing. Uh, and even when it comes to disciplining kids, what you have to ask yourself the question is, am I going to believe the Bible, do I believe God, or do I believe culture? Um, culture how do I say it lovingly? They're just doing a terrible job raising kids. Um, we live in a pain-averse culture. All pain is bad. So good parenting, according to our culture, is you save your child from pain at all costs. That's what you do. It's unbiblical. It goes against biblical principles. It goes against the principles of discipline. Uh, biblical, godly parenting is you manage discipline around your kids so they learn how to become uh, mature adults. That's what discipline is. Um, there is a time for spanking. It's not the first option for discipline. It's the last option for discipline. But there is a time where that is the only thing a child will understand. Um, let, let, me, let me just say this. According to the Word of God, which is true. Your child is born ignorant, selfish, and dependent. Now, I used to teach parenting seminars all the time, and this was the first seminar I would teach, the first session I would teach, is let's talk about you and your children. Your children are ignorant. I didn't say they're stupid, but a child is ignorant. A two-year-old is ignorant. They don't know what is best for them. They're selfish. A two-year-old is selfish. They're not unselfish. What's a favorite word of a two-year-old? Mine. They're selfish and they're dependent. You take this child, you can't take a two-year-old and say, hey, we're going out of town for the weekend, the Cheerios are in the pantry, we'll see you on Monday. They will die without you. A child is born ignorant, selfish, and dependent. That's, I'm not being negative. I'm not saying anything against your child. I'm telling you the reality of the way your child was raised. What is parenting? Parenting is raising them in such a way that by 18, they're not ignorant, they're wise. They're not selfish, they're unselfish. And they're not dependent, they're independent. How do you do that? You do that through a, a, a balance of love and discipline. A balance of love and godly discipline. Remember, discipline in our culture, parenting in our culture is, my poor child can suffer no pain, so I'm going to protect them from everything. Good parenting is, I'm going to monitor the pain that my child goes through to see that they learn lessons so that they can grow up to be what? Wise and independent and unselfish. That's what I'm trying to get them to. And I'm trying to get them to there by 18 so they can go off to college or go off on their own and learn how to live life. That's what parenting is about. And there's a graph that if you take love and discipline, and you graph that, what you'll find out is, you know where the best adults come out of? Families that have strong love and strong discipline. I didn't say strong spanking. Spanking is necessary sometimes, but strong discipline. Teaching kids the lessons they need to learn. You don't 
You don't protect them from pain, you teach them how to manage pain. And so it's high love, high discipline creates the best kids. They grow up to be the healthiest adults. They grow up to have the healthiest marriages. They grow up to have the healthiest families to pass on the, the, the legacy of your name for generations. The second strongest category is high love, low discipline. You love them unconditionally. Remember, I'm for you, for you, not for what you can do. But the discipline is lower I don't, I don't, I, I bail you out. Well, that still produces uh, some stronger adults. If you have low love, high discipline, and many people were raised in that uh, generations ago, low love, high discipline, that, that creates rebellion, and that's rebellious people. Low love, low discipline, where kids are left to raise themselves because the parents are, they don't discipline, but they also don't love. Those are the marginalized kids that end up in the drug culture and, and end up really, really struggling in life. Here's what's interesting, the low love, low discipline. You know who creates those kids more than anybody? Low love, low discipline, think about it. It's either the drug culture where the parents are high and they're completely marginalized from their child's life, child's raising themselves, or, are you ready? High dollar, wealthy culture, where mom and dad are gone out of the house, they're being raised by the nanny, Mom and dad don't have time for their kids, and the kids are raising themselves. That's where the most marginalized kids come out of. Isn't that interesting? Parenting is about what? I want to have high love. I love you for who you are. High discipline. I'm going to set boundaries around your life so you can learn how to become an adult. As you grow up, I'm going to teach you how to manage your pain and deal with pain and, and become a healthy adult. What am I going to do? I'm going to teach you to go from ignorant to wise. I'm going to teach you to go from dependent to independent. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to teach you how to go from unselfish to selfish. That's my role as a parent. As my role as a parent is not to be your best friend. Uh, you want to be best friends with your kids? Then be a parent now and you'll be best friends with them when they're 25. We're best friends with our kids. We have a great relationship with our kids. But that we weren't their best friends when they were little. So I'm just going to give you one example from what I'm talking about on this principle, and then we'll move on. Okay? This is what I'm talking about. Four-year-old sitting at the table. The glass is too close to the edge. The four-year-old is moving around too much, hits the glass on accident, and knocks it over. Spills the orange juice, let's call it orange juice, everywhere. Gets all over the table, on the, on the floor. Bad parenting. And I, yes, I'm using the word bad parenting. Here's what 95% of parents do that's bad parenting. Number one, they yell at the kid. I can't believe you did that. I told you not to put that glass too close. You never listened to me. You were, you were being still. I told you to be still. If you would have been still, if you would have moved your glass where it was supposed to be, you wouldn't have knocked it over. But no, you knocked it over. Now look at the mess you've made. What have you just communicated to your child? You are ignorant. You are stupid. And you don't know how to behave. What's the second thing the normal parent does at that point? after yelling at the kid and demeaning them and, and hurting their self-image and their self-esteem, then they go over, they get the towel out, and they clean up the mess while the kid sits there. What's the second message you, they've told their kid? You are not able to clean up your own messes. But here's the great news, you'll always have me there for you to clean up your messes. So just that one little, that one little incident at that dinner table. What has that parent communicated to that child? You're stupid. You're unable to take care of yourself, but I'll always take care of you for you. That parenting style raises 25-year-old kids who are living in the basement playing video games and can't get a job. Because it's, it's bad parenting. It just is. What's godly parenting? What's biblical parenting? What does good parenting look like? The glass is spilled. The orange juice is everywhere. 
My son is named Chris. He's done this before. This is how we raised him. Oh, Chris, I'm so sorry you spilled that. I, you know, I, I know you know where the glass goes. You had it too close, and I get that. I know you didn't do it on purpose. We don't do that kind of stuff on purpose. And, and I'm sorry that you made this mess. Now, Chris, you know where the towels are, so go clean up your mess. Now, when Chris was two, we walked him over and we opened the drawer and we helped him get the towel and we walked back over and we helped him clean up the mess. By four, Chris, I'm so sorry, go clean up your mess. Now, what are we teaching him? One, I didn't demean him for spilling his orange juice. It happens, we all make mistakes. And that doesn't mean I'm a bad person and it doesn't mean I need to be yelled at. We make mistakes. Chris, I understand you make a mistake. Chris, here's what I'm gonna teach you as your parent because I love you and I care about you. I'm gonna teach you how to clean up your own messes. Go get the towel, clean up the mess. I'm gonna help you till you're old enough to do it yourself and then I'm just gonna remind you, here's what you need to do. That's good parenting. Because what I'm teaching my child is what? You're not dependent, you're independent. You can clean up your messes. I'm teaching you wisdom. I'm, we're, we're going from ignorant to wise. We're going from selfish to unselfish. Clean up your messes. Remember when Chris was in eighth grade? <clears throat> he had a math teacher that gave him a B on a report card and he came home and he was fuming. He said, Dad, I know I made an A. Here's all of my lessons. Here's all of my homework. Here's all of my test. I made an A, she gave me a B. I said, okay, Chris, what are we gonna do? And he says, would you go with me to talk to her to get her to change my grade? And I said, no, because that's not my role. But here's what I will do with you. I will help you gather all your information here and, and teach you what to say to go approach your teacher so she will change your grade. But I'm not gonna go with you because you're a man. You're in eighth grade, you're a man. You can take care of this. You don't need me to take care of this for you. You need me to train you how to take care of yourself. So, number one, you're gonna walk in from a place of humility. You're gonna show respect for her. You're not gonna raise your voice or let emotion take over. You're gonna be prayed up when you go in there. You're gonna be very calm. You're gonna to present to her the facts and you're gonna ask her to look back over her grade book and change your grade. That's what I did for him. Oh my goodness, he was scared to death. So you know what he did? He went in, he did it, she changed his grade and he walked out feeling like a million bucks. You know why? Because I trained him to stand up for himself, to solve his problems himself. He's independent. Did you know today he sits on a board of a hospital that makes ethical decisions with doctors about patient care? He lives in New Jersey where assisted suicide is actually a law and he sits on the board that makes the decisions for those kinds of issues. And you know why he's able to do that? Because I taught him to do it in eighth grade. That's how he can do that. That's parenting, that's biblical, godly parenting. That's building a strong family. Building strong families, you have a great marriage, you give them unconditional, irrational love, I love you for who you are, and then you just teach them, you teach them. You model for them. You take this, unselfish, this selfish child and make them unselfish, this ignorant child and make them wise, this, this dependent child and make them independent through parenting them on how to take care of and clean up their own messes. That's what parenting is. And I know that goes and flies in the face of everything our, our culture teaches about parenting. My wife works in a store for young moms with, with babies. And man, these, these moms, they can't let the baby cry because we don't allow our, our child to have pain. Oh, that's, that is such, that's such emotional, irrational parenting. It's just not good parenting. Just not good parenting. Now, I'm not saying you let your baby cry himself to sleep every night. That's not what I'm saying. Just understand the concept. I want to take my child and teach them to be a strong adult. And then you know what happens? You raise great kids, and then you can be their best friend as adults. Both of my kids are married and have their own families and are strong in their faith, and we are close with them. We travel with them. We, 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 we have beautiful relationships with them because we taught them that. 
And that leads me to the last point, and that is this. Strong families create a legacy of blessedness. And I'm, I'm just going to read uh, one scripture here, uh, 20, 20, and 21. Um, no, I'm not going to read that. I've already read that. 30. Let's go back to 31, 28 again. Her children will stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. That's where we started today. And that's what I want you to hear. You can build strong families. And here's the way God created families to be. You pass down the blessing from generation to generation to generation. See, here, here's what I want you to get to today. I want you to know by the grace of God you are where you are today. Your past is your past. It's just your past. You don't have to worry about the past. It's gone. Submit yourself to Jesus Christ and ask Jesus, how do I build a strong family in the future? And He will restore what's been broken, redeem what has, what has, has, has uh, been under condemnation. He will bring all that about, and then you can start building a strong family. But if you aren't proactive about that, you're going to build, your legacy is going to be a legacy of dysfunction. You don't want that for your life. You want to build a strong family of, of unselfish, mature adult children who will bless you and walk in, in beauty and in health, emotional health, in relational health, in faithful health. And you can pass down the generation and legacy of your family from generation to generation. Let's pray. Father, boy, there was so much to say here today, and I didn't say it all, and I, I didn't want to come across as, as mean or, or uh, mean-spirited toward anyone. Lord, I know you love all people, but there's just your ways, and I'm talking about your ways. I'm not talking about whether you love people that aren't following your ways or not. We know that you do, and I do. But Lord, it's your ways, and your ways are right, and we want to we wanna follow your ways, Lord. We want to build strong families. And so, Lord, I pray for every person watching this video today that you will give them grace and mercy and forgiveness for their past and give them uh, the ability, the blessing of you to build a strong family in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Have a great day.